I'm sitting having coffee and this man comes up to me who I knew who worked for the Small Business Administration. He says, Patricia, we're looking for a director. I looked at it and I says, this is my job. So I applied, had six interviews, and I got the job. And I was like the first Latina in the country to be an SBA director out of 70 offices. And it, it was a great job, but it was also one of the most difficult jobs I've ever had, ever. But it was so great because we were helping small businesses in the whole state of Colorado. I mean, it was a great time. I was there 11 years. I loved my job. I loved it. And it worked out really well because I was going to two and three events a night sometimes. I worked seven days a week. I worked every weekend. I worked really hard. It, has been, it was male-oriented, male-dominated, and they made it very difficult for me. They would treat me like I wasn't as smart as they were, or that, you know, why am I here in this position as a Latina and a woman? You know, I felt like I put a suit of armor on every day, walk out the, out the door, out of my home, and I have to leave that suit of armor on until I get back home because it's coming at you left and right. We're somewhat blessed, not only as women, but women of color. We're really smart, <laughs> we're very smart. And we are very astute when it comes to that feeling that you get. And I use that all the time. And most of the time I was right. And that way, and what's interesting is with all those experiences I had that were negative and positive, I'm now able to share those with other women. Hopefully I left a positive uh, legacy for future women to come in and women of color and for people to realize how important the community is to get the resources from a, from a government agency. Because when I left, we were giving $1.2 billion in loans to small businesses and the majority were women and people of color. That had never happened. And that just warms my heart. Welcome to the Budget and Policy Committee of Denver City Council. This session of the Budget and Policy Committee begins now.
afternoon. Thank you for joining Denver City Council's Budget and Policy Committee. I'm Council President Stacy Gilmore, and today is June 6th. And before we get into our presentation, I'd like to have Council. And we're going to start at my left hand side here. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Kevin Flynn, Southwest Denver's District 2. Good afternoon, Jamie Torres, District 3. Good afternoon, Amanda Sawyer, District 5. Good afternoon in here, out there, all around the world, Chris Hines, Perfect 10. Good afternoon, Kendra Black, District 4. All right, well, very good. Thank you uh, to the council members who are joining us here today. And then I also want to recognize our clerk and recorder, Paul Lopez, who's joining us as well, in addition to his team. And we're going to go ahead and turn over the podium to Councilwoman Black, who, along with Council Members Sawyer and Flynn, have been working with the clerks, uh, with the clerk and his staff uh, for ballot measure reform. And so we'll turn it over to you, Councilwoman. All right, great, thank you. So um, this presentation, I'm gonna just go quickly over some of the initial slides. Um, again, here's the schedule of the Ballot Access Modernization Committee and then our presentations here at Budget and Policy. These are the goals um, of these discussions are to review the recommendations from the BAM and the clerk and recorder's recommendations as well as discuss discuss other solutions and determine if council will move forward with any ordinances and or referring ballot measures. This is just a summary. I had it at the last meeting and I've updated a bit, but those are all the topics that we discussed. Um, and you can just refer back to that if you need to. I'm not gonna go through it right now. So the topic today is the ballot information booklet. Um, and the purpose of the booklet is to inform voters. And the reason we have one in Denver for non-TABOR issues is because in 2018, our then clerk, Deborah Johnson, um, brought a bill forward to council and we approved it. Many of us were on council then. Um, and Denver is the only Colorado city that has a information booklet for non-TABOR issues. The ballot information booklet includes a fiscal note on bills um, and for council referred measures, city council may submit comments in favor and the registered voters of Denver may submit comments in opposition and the clerk can summarize the opposition comments. For initiated ordinances, the petitioners committee may submit comments in favor and registered voters may submit comments in opposition. And again, the clerk may summarize the opposition comments only. Um, in both cases, the comments- You are the man, the mayor. Um, it's really critical to us as an anchor institution that we have good dialogue and collaboration and coordination. I just wanna say- th Opposition comments are submitted, then no opposition comments are included. So some of the issues that were identified is a desire to make the booklet more like the state ballot booklet. There are concerns with the pro and con summaries. Again, the clerk can only summarize the con but can't verify it and it cannot summarize or verify the pro comments either. There's a concern that it may not appear objective if there are no con comments. Um, there's a lack of objective analysis, and um, according to attorneys, there are some legal issues with the city providing further analysis. And there's also a very tight timeline. Um, this is just comparing um, ours to the states because there, there is interest in making ours more like the states, but there's a lot of reasons we can't do that. Again, Denver's the only Colorado city to have a ballot booklet for non tabor issues. The state has an entire dedicated legislative staff that can work on the booklet, and they can start working on it 150 days in advance simply because the legislative session ends in early May. So they already know what's going to be on the ballot, and so they have much more time. And they solicit public feedback that entire time from 150 days. So way back in May, people have an opportunity to submit comments. The deadline is 50 days, but 
they have that full 100 days to submit them, so they have more robust uh, public comment period. Um, and per um, this in the revised statutes, Denver can only provide a factual summary and pro-cons statements. And again, there may be some legal issues with providing further analysis. So um, regarding um, the pro con summaries, the clerk and recorder is recommending that the clerk be allowed to collect and summarize input in favor and against for initiated and council refer. Um, currently, again, the clerk can only summarize the opposition statement. So the proposal is that, that they could also summarize the pro. Um, so just some questions about that. Um, so currently, for TABOR issues, per the, our state constitution, only um, the advocates, the proponents, can submit um, the pro statements. For council referred, council, refer, council submits the pro statements, and for citizen initiatives, the proponents submit the pro. It's not open to everybody to submit the pro um, statement. So I, that's one thing I would like you guys to think about. Do we want to open it up to more people to submit pro statements, or is it just the proponents? Um, and the clerk's proposal is that the clerk would, summar, would, would summarize both the pro and the con, and are we also okay with that? So currently, it would sort of take that away from council. Um, and again, there's this other idea that we could also invite others to submit, and then the clerk's office could summarize pro and con, con comments from a, a variety um, of input from the public. So the idea is if we had more input, would the summaries be more objective if more people are sub submitting them? And then there's a question, um, if the, the ballot booklet is presenting a balanced perspective, if there's no opposition comments. And that's why on the previous slide, I mentioned that it might be beneficial if we had more time available for people to submit comments. And maybe we could go out and you know, actively ask people to submit comments. Again, the state has a lot more time than we do. Um, so anyway, I just said the, all of that, but <laughs> the idea is again, through more public engagement and more public comment, we, we might have a better ballot booklet. Um, this is just a summary of the timeline. I'm not gonna go through it, but you can see it's pretty tight. Um, and the clerk's office has a much more um, constrained time, timeline than the state and they are gonna need more time one way or another to have an improved ballot booklet. And you can just refer back to this later if you want. So um, this is another recommendation from the clerk's office. So currently, uh, petitions have to be submitted 120 days for citizen initiatives, 120 days before the election. Um, the clerk's office is recommending that, that instead of them being submitted 120 days before the election, they have to be deemed sufficient 120 days before the election. So there's one of the recommendations. The next one is that we would move the fiscal analysis deadline to 75 days versus 60 days. We would close the comment period for the booklet from 60 days to 50. Um, and then again, we'd allow the clerk to collect and summarize input in favor and against for initiated and council referred. We already went over that one, but now I'm gonna go over the top three in a little more detail. So as I said, currently, if you have uh, petitions, you're, you have a citizen initiated initiative and you're um, getting signatures, you have to turn those in 120 days before the election. And then the clerk's office has 25 days to verify the signatures. And I know last year they had, I think, nine initiatives and they had to verify a lot of signatures. People get usually twice as many signatures as they need to and it's a lot of work for them. 
So they are recommending that we require signatures to be deemed sufficient by the 120 day deadline. Um, some concerns around that are we just need clarity for petitioners because if the signatures are deemed sufficient 120 days, when are they due? So um, that was, I don't think, I didn't hear from anyone who had any issues with that except for we would need to have some clean date when the signatures are actually due. Okay, I'm gonna just keep talking and if you wanna interrupt, go ahead. Um, this is the next recommendation from the clerk and recorder and it's to move the fiscal analysis deadline from 75 to 60 days. Um, the, I think you said it the other way. From, you're right, 270, from. yes, thank you, 275 from 60 days. And um, again, the reason why it would help them with the ballot booklet, the problem is, is council has to refer by 60 days before the election because that's when the ballot has to be certified. Um, and so it's a it's a interesting timeline. The Department of Finance could be working on it as we are discussing referring. Um, so I, I would say this isn't um, something that, that couldn't work out, but it's something to consider, that the deadline is before council's deadline to refer something. I do want to talk about at our next meeting some rules changes around the way we refer ballot measures. And one of my proposals is that we do actually create an earlier timeline for ourselves because it would allow for more public comment and community engagement around what we are referring. Um, this last one is just the closing of the comment period for the booklet. It's currently at 50 days and they're proposing that it go to 60 days um, to give them, again, 10 more days. And we didn't have any concerns or questions about that. Um, the, here are some other timelines that the clerk's office has recommended. This does not um, pertain to the November election, just the spring election. And this also doesn't relate to the ballot information booklet, but it is related to timelines, so that's why I put it in here. Um, currently, all of you know, because you've run for office, you have to turn in your petitions 55 days before the election, and that is a challenge for the clerk's office um, because they have to certify the ballot 60 days out. Um, and so they're proposing that we would turn in, candidates would turn in their petition 75 days before the election instead of 55. Um, they're also proposing to change the deadline for candidates to withdraw from 48 to 60. And again, it's just because of their deadlines, particularly for um, overseas ballots. And um, the BAM talked about these briefly. There weren't any real concerns raised about these two. Um, this one, however, is the timeline for write-in candidates. Um, the clerk's office is recommending a change to the deadline for write-in candidates to file from 15 days to 60 days. Um, and the reason why is they have to print a very lengthy ballot using a lot of paper and resources um, and they would like to avoid that. Um, the concerns are when we have some, you know, extenuating circumstances, some emergencies when we do need to have write-ins. Um, and so I just gave some examples, but if someone, you know, their spouse gets relocated and they have to move away, you know, a month before the election, or they have to withdraw because of illness, or if someone dies. I'm, um, in District 9, Car Carla Madison died after the ballots were certified um, and uh, there were a lot of people who ran for that and they did, they did need to write in. Um, and then also there might be some kind of scandal or something and someone drops out. Those were just some ideas that um, people came up with. So that was that recommendation. Um, okay, so that's all I have for timelines. And what I'd really like to do is see what questions you have 
and just any feedback you have on any of these, this is really just intended for discussion and to hear your thoughts on any of these moving forward. All right, well, thank you, Councilman Black. And I uh, currently don't have anyone in the queue, and so would ask, oh, there we go. All right, great. Council Pro Tem Torres, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Councilwoman uh, Black. There was a um, slide, I think it was slide number 10, um, where you said um, uh, for the clerk and recorder to summarize uh, pro statements, we would be relinquishing something that council does. That's just for the ones that we generate, right? The council Correct. referred. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, the um, proponents who do citizen um, sponsored, they, they write their own. Mm -hmm. Pro statements. So this would apply to all of them. Yeah, okay. and I, I'm, I think it's a good recommendation that citizen initiatives and council referred should be treated the same. Um, but just want to put it out there for you guys to discuss. Sure. Okay. Um, the only other um, clarification that I had was um, for the uh, election timing for the um, candidate petitions. Would the um, 90, I think it's 90 days that you're allowed to pull your petitions. Um, would that date also move or would it now shrink? It would also move. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's they would expand that too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Council Pro Tem Torres. Council Member Sawyer. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, thanks, Councilwoman Black. And just to follow up with Councilman Tor Councilwoman Torres' last question. Um, one of the things that we had talked about at the ballot access modernization committee meetings was um, if, so it, based on the current timing, if we just back up the date of the um, the date that that uh, pe candidate petitions are due, um, that date looks like the polling date, that 55 days ends up being like around the Christmas, New Year's holiday um, or like early, you know, mid-December. So we had talked about also the potential of um, lengthening that period of time in recognition of the fact that there would be, you know, a number of people taking the holidays um, who wouldn't be home to sign petitions or things like that if there was door knocking happening. So uh, yes is the short answer. And then also the clerk's office had discussed the potential of extending that from um, so that you could pull the petitions a little bit earlier in just to have a few more days in recognition of that of that sort of holiday season. Um, so wanted to just follow up on that. Um, and I don't know, does someone from the clerk's office want to address that? Is it, have you, do you have a, a number of days or is that something that you're intending to include? Hi, Councilman, where's the microphone? We got rid of it. It's very oh fancy. Uh -huh. I'm not just upgrading all over. Um, uh, Councilman, I, it, that's fine with us. What we want to be able to do is also um, give candidates more time to be able to do it. That's why we propose, propose that, that extension to 75 days. Um, the one thing that we just have to be uh, mindful of is that we are still ending an election in November. And so we have you know, uh, the November election, then we go through the process for our uh, risk limiting audit, and then we go to canvas. And that canvas usually takes place, you know, the late November could potentially leak into beginning of December if we have an issue. It's, you know, these are deadlines that are set by the Secretary of State, so it does have a little bit of time there. We just want to be careful not to have both uh, both the caboose and the engine of the train touch. Because if that's the case, then we, you know, it, it, it totally hinders our operations. The other thing to think about is that our election judges and our, and our staff, they're winding down that election. These are the same kind of election judges and voter services that come on board to start verifying and doing that kind of work too. So um, we're fine with a little, a few days here and there to account for the three holidays uh, that exist. But um, any more of that, it'll be kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. That's great. I think it's just, um, I really appreciate that. And I think that's, it just uh, makes it a little bit easier for candidates who, uh, you know, are working or have, you know, other things that are happening to be able to have that yeah. little bit of flexibility just because yeah. basically nothing happens between that week of Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's. And um, I think, I can't remember when it was when we ran, but I want to say it was like early January. 
so sort of like right after people came back was when we picked up uh, our ballots. Alton, you're shaking your head yes at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, if we're going to back it up to right around that holiday season, adding a couple extra days would be would be really great. Thanks. Thanks that, you know, accounting for those calendar holidays is fine with us. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one other quick question for uh, you guys, and I don't know uh, which of you uh, wants to address it, and, and I guess it is also a question for Councilwoman Black um, to pose to the entire um, council. So, and I don't know um, off the top of my head exactly which dates are set by um, the Secretary of State's office versus which are set by us, but there's a lot of like moving around, right? And it seems like a lot of the uh, places where we've landed in terms of getting enough time for BMO to do a fiscal analysis, getting enough time for you guys to do signature verification and um, translation and all of those different kinds of things is 75 days. Um, would it be possible and or would it make sense to just move everything to 75 days uh, that, that we're talking about here? The reason I'm asking is because it's incredibly confusing. And for, yeah. you know, public who wants to, you know, who want to run a, an initiated ordinance or whatever, um, being able to say, like, X is at 75 days, Y yeah. is at 120 days, you know, Z is at whatever days, would just be so much more, would be so much easier. Is it possible for us to do that? Well, we, a lot of those dates are set by the Secretary yeah, of State's Yeah, that's why office. I couldn't remember like which um, was which. Or the printing, are there ways yeah. for us to align? There, there's a, I, I thought the way you did, and I was like, why not just make everything 75 days and I'll make our lives completely easier. But what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Ben, who's my uh, policy director in <laughs> office. And um, he can speak to that. He comes from the Secretary of State's office, very familiar with this, those timelines. I'll put like, the timeline slide back up. Great. And then this is the timelines that, so our office is hit pretty hard. To, these, and clerk, we might, we might need you in front oh, of the podium. Sorry. for The mic's so, good, but it's yeah, not. Sorry about it, that. I'm so, yeah. just not used to the, <laughs> not having the mic here. Um, so we have a chart with those timelines, and I mean, in addition to that, you, you, you council members, you do have a graph chart based off of all those timelines that we put together. It was a lot of work to put that together, but that is kind of the universe that we got to deal with, right? You got federal, state, and then local election laws that have to coexist, right? And then a lot of those because of printing and operations. We have tight turnarounds, and so we, we have to put those order in, orders in pretty quick. Nowadays, it, I mean, especially with this cycle, all of us, Public election officials across the country are, are, are freaking out a little bit because of the paper supply shortages with the mills. And so the, you have to account for a lot of those other things too. So I could definitely understand why you're thinking 75 days, which is something that I would think, but there are also some things that are just 100% tied to the Secretary of State's office and those requirements. And Ben uh, Schleyer, our um, policy and compliance administrator will speak to those. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, we, we love uniformity uh, in elections, so that is something that we would absolutely be in favor of to the extent that we're able to do that. And as um, the clerk mentioned, uh, those punks at the Secretary of State's office have, have uh, set some of those dates um, in stone. Uh, Title I really set some of those dates in stone. Um, we also know that um, our initial um, idea, the idea that moving the um, fiscal information from Department of Finance I think Department of Finance um, felt like maybe that was a little bit too close to, to their work as well. And so I think we're um, amenable to, to working on those dates. I think for us though, for any of these deadlines, um, the farther we can push them back away from certifying the ballot, which is kind of that, you know, that kind of hard and fast deadline where we have to get things done, um, that's great for us. If, if there was one very particular one that we would all be concerned about, I think in the, in the clerk and recorder's office, it's that uh, deadline to submit uh, petitions so that we're not reviewing petitions at the same time or after the time that we're um, actually certifying the ballot. But I do think just looking at this list that there probably are some, some that are a few dates that we could uh, create a little bit more uniformity. I, I think that would be great. I think um, it's, <coughs> as you know, because you guys have a timeline that like spans all the walls of a room up yeah. there. Um, if there is, it's incredibly confusing. And um, if there is a way to standardize to the extent that we can um, dates 
I just think that for our residents, it makes a lot more sense. It's a lot easier, it's a lot more clear, um, and that can only help when it comes to setting expectations for the public of exactly what this process looks like. And if we're going for transparency and accountability as we are, that makes, to me, the most sense. That, that makes perfect sense, and I think that, um, that our office could work with Councilmember Black uh, probably to put some of that in, in, in more of a, a viewable format and, and look at some of those things that we could make uniform um, uh, for a future date. That's great. I really appreciate that. Um, and then I had an, one other question for you all, and I and I can't remember it right now, so I'm going to click out because I know there's two other council members in the queue, and then I will get back to you. Thanks. All right, great. Thank you, Councilman Sawyer. And Ben, would you introduce yourself for the public record? Yeah, my apologies. My name is Ben Schler, and I am the Policy and Compliance Administrator for the Denver Clerk and Recorder's Office. Very good. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you to the clerk for being here. Uh, Councilmember Flynn. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Clerk uh, Lopez, could you go over again the reasoning why changing the deadline for write-in candidates to file uh, back, all the way back to 60 days, uh, and that it only applies to the spring muni election? Councilwoman, it's slide 18. Yeah. What's the thinking behind that? Because I remember, <clears throat> I believe, a write-in candidate in the 2015 election for mayor, uh, Larry Ambrose, uh, registered quite late and still got 2,000 write-in votes, which is pretty remarkable yeah. uh, for a word-of-mouth social media campaign. Uh, but he didn't he didn't file until, and he didn't decide he wanted to be a write-in until then, uh, a couple weeks before. So what's the thinking? Why 60 days and why only uh, to the spring election, the muni election? So one, with the, with the muni election, we're not tied to the Secretary of State's uh, rules as much as, as as we are with a general or a coordinated election that's in, you know coordinated with the state. Um, the other thing, so there's a couple of things. One is um, every if there is if ballot length nowadays, you have to have a write-in candidate, a write-in space for every single candidate. Okay. So what that does is it saves paper and it allows us to be able to verify early on. Who is who is a candidate, so we can actually print their name on that okay. on that ballot. Uh, so it, it saves some operational time, it saves us resources, it saves the city some money because it actually start ten, it shortens the ballot. Believe it or not, um, and then the other thing too is when we look at, and I was on council when this happened, when our colleague Carla Madison had passed away. Um, I was I was going to mention that what happened then because we had like eighty. You, right. you had 30-something candidates 30 that were writing candidates, right. and it was within that deadline. Exactly. So rather than have a special election in what was District 8 at the time, and have, it was almost like a shootout within those 30 days mm -hmm. um, um, to the election. So um, it, it was whoever, whoever had money could put that uh, website up, and then and you go from there. So what we heard of after that, and what we heard from after that, especially the conversations that we had on council, and we were actually thinking at changing it at the time because it was it was an issue that was being brought up at the time, and there was a lot of worry from the district eight uh, um, candidates in the, in the in the race and the constituency is that they there was no time for debate, there was no campaigning, there was right. really nothing that they can do to really hear from their candidates. Um, it was that close to the election, so uh, Ben Ben has some other. Um, so what, let me ask, uh, Clerk, what would have happened had this rule been in effect in there? Because what you're saying is you, we would no longer print under each candidate race, we would no longer print a last line that says check here and write in. That's right. So That's right. Okay. Uh, so and what would have happened, you were asking? So what would have happened in 2011? Special election, special yeah. election for, uh, for District 8. A special election, okay. And although, it, you know, one would probably say, well, that's more money, you got to do run a special election for that district. That's part of the democratic process, right. and that's one thing that we want to be able to ensure. Right. Okay. Ben, do you want to um, address the other question? Thanks, Ben Schler with the Clerk and Recorder's Office. I'll just give a, a little bit of extra detail. And the first one, Councilmember Flynn, I think was your question about why it only applies to the spring municipal, and the only reason for that is that the Secretary of State's office actually already does what we're uh, suggesting, which is push it back toward the, the um, certification of the ballot. Um, I dealt with this at the Secretary of State's office a few times 
um, with recall elections because, as you know, the recall elections for state offices, that's all a constitutional matter for the most part. And that 15-day deadline is actually a relic of, I think, 1912, which was the first time that they amended uh, the Constitution uh, as it related to recall election and was a time when folks, you know, were, were all going to the polls and, and ballots were, were created in real time. Um, um, a couple of things. The first one that I want to make sure um, I note is that, and I'll, and I'll try to be brief, it's just that the, um, the administrative, uh, um, I don't want to say hassle, but the administrative work that's required on the part of the elections division to um, not only create that additional line for a write-in on each, on each race on the ballot, that is one thing, and that does create a, a quite a bit of space, but there's also a significant amount of time spent by our elections division and the election judges who are reviewing ballots, because as you send those ballots through, and I'm sure you've seen before, not only do people um, bubble in and write in accurately writing candidates who have actually qualified for the ballot, but a lot of times they write in their own name, they write in Mickey Mouse's name, they write in names that are not qualified. Each time one of those is either bubbled or written in, it gets kicked out by the machine, and then you have to go through the process of adjudication. And that's a pretty significant timeline, particularly in a world where um, we see um, so many folks um, who are not necessarily uh, living their lives day to day in the election world asking us to get those election results out quickly. And so that, I think that that is a, a real concern for us just from an administrative side. You look like you have a that's question. That's interesting. I, as I recall the 2000 election in Florida, that that was an issue where some people unfamiliar with the ballots the way they were in Florida who voted for Al Gore and then also wrote in Al Gore and right. validated those ballots. That's right, it an and it, it, it's absolutely right. And for the most part, um, we've learned some lessons from that with regard to when a write-in vote counts or doesn't count, but because of the technology that we use, that all gets spit out and, and it creates a, a pretty significant timeline. Your other question was um, for the 2015 um, example that you gave and also the 2011 example of the, the few times where um, either a writing candidate received a lot of votes or there was no other candidate other than the, right. other than a writing candidate. Um, if we didn't have what we have now, what would happen? Um, and uh, Clerk Lopez said correctly that under the current code, what would happen is a special election. And I think from our perspective, we're not completely against the idea of a special election being that because it is um, fairly anonym, uh, anomalous, right? Compared to the administrative cost and burden versus uh, the anomalous um, occurrence of a write-in actually having the, 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 the chance of winning the election. Um, I'll throw out, um, if you'll indulge me, one way that the state has dealt with this in order to ensure both that writing candidate lines don't have to appear on every single office line within a ballot, and there's a process for replacing a candidate who um, fits one of the bullets that Council Member Black um, put on her spreadsheet, which is essentially usually whether you've been disqualified, you've withdrawn, or you've, or you've died. And, and we've dealt with all of those things um, here in Denver and at the state. And what the state does for political parties, obviously the political parties have um, the, uh, they have a political party uh, process, they have vacancy committees, and they can fill a, a, a vacancy and nomination on the ballot, and then the clerk um, for each county has ways at the state level to inform voters that someone has been replaced on the ballot. Um, in this case, we are talking about a nonpartisan election where you don't have the political party apparatus to make that change. What, what um, the state has done um, in those similar cases, and those cases are for unaffiliated candidates who appear on the ballot, is they've created a vacancy committee process that starts at the petition level where an unaffiliated candidate would be allowed to designate three individuals. This is how the state does it. I'm not saying this is exactly how we would propose doing it, but I think it's a pretty good process. On the petition, you designate three individuals who would be uh, members of your vacancy committee. So the person who has gone through the process of petitioning on the ballot, um, getting the requisite signatures to get on the ballot and being placed on the ballot is in charge of what happens if that person uh, dies, is disqualified, or withdraws. And so you, um, designate that vacancy committee, and if one of those things happens, that committee gets to fill that space. And so you're balancing that versus, for example, in 2011, um, I believe that the, the winning candidate in that race, uh, where the candidate uh, um, had died before, um, before the election, I think it was somewhere around 600, a little bit more than 600 uh, folks who voted for a writing candidate. Um, in the case uh, that I just described for unaffiliated candidates, 
all the votes cast for the candidate who was already on the ballot, those votes would go to the person who was designated um, through that vacancy process. That's that's one idea. Um, that's something that we've been kicking around at the office, and I think we're pretty open to a discussion on that, but we are pretty um, steadfast in the idea that uh, write-in is pretty difficult and, and creates a lot of barriers for us. Certainly. Uh, let me ask uh, Clerk Lopez and maybe Councilwoman Kanich, who's joined us, might recall this. Did uh, Councilwoman Madison, was she unopposed in that race in 2011, when uh, the one in which she passed away? Uh, I believe so. I, I can't remember. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm, she was sitting right there. So. Okay, so you only had Carla Madison and a potential write-in? Yeah. Okay. From, from the best of my knowledge, do I remember? I don't think she was opposed, and that was the more people raising their. You're, huh? you're right. Thank you. I would rely on, on Alton's uh, memory. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, that's all, Madam President. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Flynn, and um, would like to welcome Councilmember Kanich um, to Budget and Policy. Um, yep. Mic's on. Um, I'll speak up. Um, Councilmember Hines, you're up next. Uh, thank you, Council President. I um, was going to go down the same line of questioning or, or thought process that Councilmember Flynn just went down. Uh, so I'll just add a, a tidbit. I was very close to filing for District 8 in 2011. So uh, I had a campaign manager. I already had a logo. Um, and uh, we were incorrect. My campaign manager was incorrect with the filing deadline. And by the time the deadline had come, there were only three candidates and as you, as, as you mentioned, the deadline, we were wrong about the deadline, but um, it was 38 candidates that ultimately filed. So um, it, was, uh, it, turned in, it turned from a very uh, organized number of people to a, a, a wide open race, I guess. So I ended up not filing. So I didn't file, I didn't withdraw, uh, but, uh, but I, that's, that's part of the reason why I know also that uh, Councilmember Madison was unopposed. Um, I, I do have a question for uh, elections. Um, with a write-in candidate, uh, I think I recall also you must accurately spell the name of your candidate, right? So if you misspell the person's name, that is, uh, that, that is stricken. Is that correct? Hi, Ben Schler with the, the Clerk and Recorder's Office. Um, um, there was a time that that was correct now under um, the Secretary of State's rules for determining the validity of a writing candidate, as long as um, the election judges who are reviewing that, and that has to be a bipartisan team, as long as they determine that um, um, that they have no doubt that the person who was intending to vote for the qualified writing candidate did do so, even if, say, they switched, you know, an I and an E or something like that, that it would still count. Or an E and a D, um, which in my case uh, was one of the big concerns, is that my the spelling of my surname is a bit um, more unusual. So we were thinking H-I-N-E-S or H-E-I-N-Z before H-I-N-D-S, particularly considering the compressed timeline. Sure. Um, they're certainly under what I just described, a little bit of subjectivity. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, the, the standard for the judges um, is that they have both agreed that the person's intent was to vote for that writing candidate. And the final question that I have, um, if you could pull the mic closer to you, by the I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Oh. Um, the, uh, how much does a special election cost? I mean, because that's, that, I think that's, un, that, that's, the, that's the idea, right? So if it goes from 15 to 60 days, then uh, if something happens, Within that 60, oh, it depends on the district size. Um, if, it hap, if, it, you know, if, if we move from 15 to 60 days, then we would do a special election. Uh, let's say the district size is about 65,000. Uh, I'm not sure if we could, because, of, because it's been so long since we've actually held a special election, um, I'm not sure if we could if we could give you that answer, if I could give you that answer off the top of my head other than to say that it is variable on the size of the district. Um, I think I would go back to saying that um, particularly when a special election is only required um, if you have a candidate who dies, withdraws, um, or is deemed disqualified and has no other, um, there are no other candidates on the ballot for that office, that it's 
it's a, a, a you know, it's unusual. a very low chance, unusual that it's going to happen, yeah. but I don't have great numbers for you off the top of my head, but I'm sure that's something that we could probably work on um, at the clerk's office if you wanted us to follow up with you. Uh, no need, um, but I do recall that we were discussing that when we were considering uh, options of either move the election, uh, you know, in, in uh, May of 2023 to April of 2023, or, um, you know, ranked choice voting, is that I think the a citywide election in Denver costs a million dollars each time we do it, I, if, if I recall the number correctly. Um. Councilman, it just make it just depends on what district we're talking about, right? Um, so some districts have a lot of registered voters, um, active uh, registered voters. Others don't. Uh, I represented one that didn't have a lot, but had had the same amount of people as any other district. So that just depends on which district it is. Um, a citywide race um, is close to a million dollars, and that also depends, right? It depends on the price of paper. <laughs> depends on postage, right? So I think there's a lot um, that goes into it. Okay, thank you. And then we, we, we keep increasing the amount of registered voters now that we're, we've eclipsed 500,000 well, in 2020. That's unfortunate. We need to get rid of, all, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, Council President. All right, thank, thank you, you Councilmember Hines, and thank you, Clerk Lopez. We've got Councilmember Sawyer. Thanks, Madam President. Um, I remembered what it was that I wanted to discuss. I got distracted by timelines, but I'm back now. So when it comes to the blue book, um, I did want to just make sure that I understand um, the proposal for who will be writing the pro and con statements. Um, because while I 100% think that we should um, allow for you know, open comments and as much public comment as possible, and then to have the clerk's office um, summarize those. As someone who has written um, the pro statement for a charter change amendment, I would be have been very frustrated if I had written that and then it had gotten summarized. So is it is it possible to uh, make changes in a way, I'm looking at you, <laughs> Clerk Lopez. I almost called you councilman, I'm so used to that. Uh, so um, is there, can we just kind of clarify that um, for the pro statements and any con statements um, by the, the actual petitioners, or like in my case, by council referral, it stays and then other pro statements be summarized or something like that. I just, I think the people who write the initiated ordinances or the charter changes uh, that you know were referred by me, it, like it really mattered to me exactly what was said in that 500 words. And I worked really, really hard on it and I would have not been happy if it had gotten summarized. So how are we gonna uh, right. kind of sort that out. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam President, Alton Diller, Communications Manager, Denver Elections. Just want to contextualize this discussion a little bit. When we're talking summarization, it's literally to comply with the requirement that something be underneath 500 words. If it comes in under 500 words, we don't touch it. But as a for instance, this last election, we got a legal reading that hyphens constitute words. So a couple of these ones that we thought were under 500 came in at 507. And so we had to summarize there. The only other time summarization occurs is if, like in the instance of the pro statements that come in from the public, if we get more of those and they're over 500 words, we have even had one time where we had two different proponents come in to our office with a red pen to get them down to 500. But we do not take any editorial license over what is submitted other than to make sure that it gets under the 500 and to quote the clerk, make sure it doesn't contain any F-bombs or anything like that. Okay, so, oh, Clerk Lopez, did you wanna? So go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So that's great. Um, but one of the challenges that we're looking at here, and I think on one of the slides, I'm trying to look for the slide now. Uh, I can't remember. 10? I think I know what you're 10? Doing. Right. So there's this issue of truth and yeah. veracity. And um, that yeah. gets to be a tough one when we're talking about the potential for summarizing yeah. uh, things that are over 500 words. And then, um, you know, if, if there's public comment that is available that comes in that is false, 
or could potentially be false. Um, you know, what does that look like there? So right now we don't have that ability. Okay. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, yes, Denver is the only one that has a blue book because it's rather difficult for a municipality that whose legislative branch and all of its, you know, workings is year round and does not have a break. So that Office of Legislative Services in the, in, in the state is an apple and we are not even an orange, right? In terms of our, our capability to do that. Now, um, it gets into the sticky waters because, because of these deadlines, it actually pushes us to have to create a, a team of researchers to verify if those statements are true or false. And it rings really, really, really close. So it's, it's just not, it's not an apples to apples conversation. The blue book, um, y'all probably saw the same thing that I was just very embarrassed about because it was true, is characterized as Facebook on paper because we cannot verify statements or not, whether they come from the proponent or they com come from the opposition, the con statement. So for us, it's, and let me just be clear from my perspective as, as, as the clerk, um, an initiated ordinance is different from a council referred measure. And the council referred measure, the pro that you submit for the blue book, we're agnostic whether you, if you, your intent is to, to keep that intact and move it forward as council, that council has always done, we're fine with that. I'm completely agnostic with that. Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's more of a, um, a tightening up of, of the deadlines but not necessarily being able to so, edit beyond much. Um, okay. It's frustrating. No, I appreciate that. It's um, a lot of paper. So I have to ask the question for the public then, why do we have a blue book? Because to me, I would rather mm -hmm. the, the residents who are voting um, be able to make that, do the research if they care that much and make those decisions for mm -hmm. themselves as opposed to reading a blue book mm -hmm. that could and has contained untrue statements that the clerk's office has zero power or authority to um, edit in any way, shape, or form except for to get it under 500 words. I mean, to me, that's, it, it would save us money, it would save us time, we wouldn't have to be having this conversation. Why, why, are we, why do we have a blue book then? Councilman, that's, Councilman, it's a very good question because um, under my administration, we often wanted the same thing, only because it is a bit of a liability when there are, um, when there's misinformation in the blue book uh, in terms of uh, content. Right. Um, but also at the end of the day, um, it is a book that we send to not every single voter, but every single household. And we used to send it to every single voter and we used to print that and send it to every single voter. But during my administration, we narrowed it down to households so that we are, winting, we are printing one book um, to minimize the impact of paper um, and the use of paper. So I think that, that's, a, that's definitely a question. It didn't, it didn't start with my administration. I think that was something that council in the, in the, in the past. And I, I, and I understand that, that, yeah, you know, I think Councilwoman Black, do you wanna yeah. mm -hmm. so. um, jump in? Yeah, so as I said earlier, this was a proposal brought by our clerk then um, Deborah Johnson and council supported it. And I think in retrospect, there's a lot of issues with it. And so I was introducing a, an additional layer to what it, the clerk is proposing in that we need to solicit additional input from people. And you all can speak for the state, but the state gets so many comments back that I think it sorts itself out to ensure that what they are putting in the blue book is accurate. So if they get, you know, a lot of comments and they have to summarize them so they fit in the blue book, they sort through them. Um, but in our case, it's so condensed, there's not much time, and there's been numerous times when we haven't gotten any opposition comments and that doesn't seem like balanced information, and it seems like we should be doing something proactively to solicit most, I think, more, more pro and con. I think we, we're, we need to be careful that the pro comments, whether they're coming from council or a committee, 
are not simply advocacy. And so I think it would be more fair if there were multiple pro comments also and that they could summarize those too. I think the more input we get in that blue book, the better the quality of the information. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that if there was a way to um, collect pro comments in addition to the, the whoever is bringing the ordinance, the initiated ordinance or the um, you know charter council, charter change, whatever, um, that that's great, and that's certainly one way to do it. And I definitely think that it's a, a a way to address that issue. But it does then add cost because that adds length, which then adds to the weight and also to the amount of pages that they're printing. So mm -hmm. like so so uh, I'm just sort of asking, I guess, the question, because it seems to me it's more important that voters not be fed false information than it is that they be fed a blue book that could be false and could be not. Like, And if it saves us money to just not send a blue book, um, to me, that feels like a, a more responsible and fair way to to go, but I mean, and I certainly understand if we're gonna keep the blue book, like, yes, let's do uh, this proposal. I just, it seems like hearing um, the conversation and the questions and from the conversations we've had at BAM, let's just not have a blue book anymore. Well, that is definitely something council could consider if, if council members wanted to go that direction. Um, I'm not sure if... And I'm not sure yeah. if they do, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure that it's the right decision. It's yeah. certainly something to talk about more. Yeah. But yeah. It's we can very talk scary, about that. the idea that, we're handi that we are, as a government, purposely, um, knowingly sending false information to people because we don't have the ability to change what comes in. That's yes. okay. very concerning. I don't think it, it's false information, but I'll let, I'll let them elaborate on that. And I just want to cor correct or clarify something you just said about if we, if we solicited more comments and had a more robust comment period, I do believe that it would sort the information out. It wouldn't make it any longer because you can only have 500 words combined. If they got 500 people responded, you don't have... 500 people with 500 words. It's a total of 500 words. So it's the same length either way. But the more input they get, I think it's the better is the process. But okay. I'll let yeah. the clerk yeah. answer that about. Totally. That would be, you know, whether they have a, uh, our blue book or not, because it, it was council bill, um, I think it, that's up to the council. We are very agnostic in terms of that. It is. You know, I think, you know, we, we, everything that comes from our office has to be trusted information, especially now. Anything that has, uh, that's associated with our office, Denver elections, official election mail has to be accurate. Um, now, when it comes to the blue book, like I said, we do not have what the state has. And this is why, this is, I assume this is why you don't have any other counties or cities doing that, what the state does because of the capacity um, and, the, and, the, and the kind of work that's done by the Office of Legislative Services over, right, around the year. And I think it's, a, it's, it's something that we have to definitely consider. Um, anything that comes from us that is not a pro or con statement is not, um, let me just say it the other way, is factual. If it's coming from the Denver Elections Division, where to vote, how to vote, procedures with your ballot, instructions, that is absolutely accurate. What we cannot control is the pro or the con on the issues that are there. And that's where a lot of people um, tend to spar over, and that's the kind of stuff that ends up on Kyle Clark, that um, I have to share his embarrassment. So can over. I just ask, I guess I need a little clarification, because it sounds to me like, um, what Councilwoman Black's proposal is saying is that um, no matter how many com comments come in uh, from the public, they are summarized in 500 words by the clerk's office and then put out to the public. Um, pro, no matter how many pro statements come in, they are summarized in 500 words and put out to the public. Um, and so kind of, number one, is that the 
am I, am I understanding the proposal on the table correctly? Because when I ask the question as a proponent, right, as someone who wrote one of those, um, Alton said it had to do with 500 words, and I know that it has just been, that they've all just been published up to 500 words up to this point. Yes, so, Okay, so just sorry to confuse. The clerk's recommendation is different than, I, than I'm, I'm suggesting we maybe do a little more beyond that. Okay. Um, but their recommendation is that they would summarize for for council and for the in it, the initiate the initial initial and initial and process. yes although I mean, yeah, all, yeah, pro, all and pro and con right now they do not summarize for the pro statements for either council referred or citizen initiated okay that's true so but what i'm saying back to my initial question then as a person who has written a pro statement because it was my charter amendment that was referred by council, I would not, I would be very upset if it was um, summarized. That's where we get into sticky waters. Right. And so, that's where our office becomes an editor and, you know, to previous conversations that were had here, you know, it's one thing to, 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 to set a title, which we do very well and we've done, but it's another thing to go into the meat of the proposal and change that and I think and, and edit it and summarize it and I think that's where that's where we are we, we don't want to do that we don't like to do that that's something that's you know it, it's agnostic and also uh, we're agnostic on it and also because you as you know the initiated ordinance process is a lot different from the charter referred the charter referred if that's our charters council referred your council referred measures go through that whole process that's something that you all put with the intent on your pro statement um, we, I wouldn't, I, I would kind of feel like this council's process, it's something that you guys decide and you move forward, we can summarize it, but at the end of the day, um, that's where it becomes convoluted. Now, it, depending on how many pro and cons come in, it would be a little bit of a challenge. I think the only thing that we can do is kind of find the common denominator language and use that, but to be quite honest, this is something that it's new to us, this idea, and, and for, for me to be able to speak confidently as the clerk and what our operations and abilities in our operations would do, impact on our budget, <clears throat> staff, um, I would have to go back to, to our staff and kind of create a new process map that kind of looks at that and using and drawing that into our process yeah. to see if that can work. I remember, for us, the most precious things with some of these changes that you're going to see in front of you are our timelines. Right? Because timelines mean operation, they mean people, they mean um, uh, compliance. Okay, I guess um, sh back to my sort of original question of the beginning, thank you for that by the way, yeah, of the beginning you. of this conversation then. Um, if sending a blue book is what we want, uh, is the decision that council makes we want to continue to print a blue book, um, then I agree with Councilwoman Black that we must do something to, um, you know, better clarify uh, pro and con statements. I guess what I am asking is, is it possible to have the initiators, or if it's council referred council, write um, the pro statement and then summarize any other public statement that came in? Because I think that it, like, it, that really matters. It really matters to me that whoever is bringing the legislation be able to say their 500 words of peace and not have it touched uh, beyond limiting to 500 words um, as long as there's no F-bombs in it, right? But then if there's other pro uh, statement feedback that comes in summarizing that as well as summarizing the cons, does that, is that something that's possible to do? Yeah, Ben Schler with the Clerk and Recorder's Office, yes, and I think the 500 um, was initially um, something that came you know, from Tabor, um, but I think that we like your idea. That's something that we hadn't necessarily considered, and it's a good one. Okay, appreciate that. Thanks. Did you wanna add anything, Clerk? Did you wanna add anything, Councilwoman Black? I do, I just wanna make sure that either council members submitting the pros or the, the proponents of a citizen initiative, that they don't appear to be advocacy 
or editorials in favor. And so that's one thing you'll see with the state blue book is it's very neutral. And I, we've seen things in the blue book that proponents and council members have written that, that are, are advocating for the, for the measure rather than um, just simply a, a pro comment. I don't, I'm not articulating that very well. No, but I, I think, think I we need, what you're we want it to be very balanced and factual and not, not like an opinion piece that you would read it in the Denver Post. And sometimes they do appear like that. Okay. And I think we need to get away from that. But I'd love Ben to tell us a little bit more about how the state, how, like how many pros and cons statements they get and how then they condense them, combine them. And we really, and th yes, if you wouldn't mind doing that, I would really appreciate that as well. Um, but I did just want to ask the lawyers, is there, lawyers in the room, um, is there a way to um, write the ordinance or make changes to the ordinance um, that through language could give the flexibility needed to sort out some of the issues in this conversation? Or is that something that gets the city into extremely gray waters legally and something we want to stay away from. And the reason I'm asking is because I, then it, that makes a, vi a big difference to me in terms of getting rid of the blue book altogether versus uh, moving forward with Councilwoman, Black, Councilwoman Black's proposal. Uh, thanks, Councilwoman Sawyer. On Shilbaga, Assistant City Attorney. And Troy, Post Office may want to jump in on this after I answer. But um, broadly speaking, yes, I think that the ordinance draft could include some language that allows the clerk's office more authority to, um, to assess comments generally. We do have to be careful about certain state laws and city laws that prohibit the city from spending money on advocating for or against a proposed ballot measure. Um, but broadly speaking, there may be some room, yes. Um. Thanks, Anshul. Troy Bratton from the city attorney's office. Um, I agree with what Anshul says. Um, there, there are definitely ways to write what you're suggesting, like the proponent could submit pro comments and then other um, residents of Denver could submit pro comments and those, um, those could be summarized. There, there are policy reasons for and against that, certainly. Um, I think an area where we would have to be careful that kind of came up in the discussion, and I'm not suggesting that anybody up here is suggesting this, but when it comes to the veracity or truthfulness of the comments, we have to be very careful there. I mean, the clerk's role is ministerial when it comes to elections. It's to take whatever is coming in and to place it on the ballot without, you know, any putting any lens on it, you know, verifying it or doing any research on it. So. I think we do have to be very careful there, and I think the clerk's proposal is an attempt to get, you know, more speech. You know, but by, by having more speech, you can kind of weed out what, you know, or a, a voter can kind of see maybe what is true or what isn't true. Um, so I think that's the attempt there. So that's the only area I would kind of caution um, from a legal perspective. Again, there there may be policy reasons about the proponents um, pro comments that um, we could look into, but. Okay, That's really I appreciate Thanks. that. Thank you. Did, ben, did you want to um, jump in now? I know. Did, did you want Councilman Black to repeat her question, or I, are you? No, I, I think I got it. Ben, ben Schler with the clerk's office, um, and I wish that I could give a better answer, answer Councilwoman Black. Um, I've been part of that process as a member of the Secretary of State's office, but that's housed with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, at the legislature, and so while I understand um, generally what they do, which is very comprehensive, including bringing in individuals um, who have submitted pro comments and who have submitted con comments and actually interviewing them and compiling that information, they have much more time to do that and they have significantly more resources to do that. Um, I, I wish I could give a little bit more in-depth answer, but that's pretty much what I know, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Madam President. All right, great, thank you. Great conversation, everybody. I appreciate uh, the, the dig down into it. Um, I did have a follow-up um, on this question, and then um, Council Member Kanich, thank you so much for your patience um, as well. But um, Clerk Lopez, as to um, you know, 
your suggestion uh, or recommendation is currently your office um, would do some of this work. And I guess what is the budget impact um, that do you have estimates of what that might look like, et cetera, staffing? Well, I mean, it, it, it usually is just a handful, a small handful of folks who are in the room we work with our um, compliance and policy and also with our, with our city attorney, Troy, um, to kind of go through it, edit it. Um, we've had it in the past and then move it forward, but I don't know if you wanted to speak to the budget a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So my uh, deputy clerk in the is Audrey Klein. However, um, end of my time. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Speak to President, I can keep this fairly quick. Um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Oh, absolutely. Audrey Klein, Deputy Clerk and Recorder. Thank you for having me. Um, broadly, budgetary impact would be minimal in that this is a process that we already do. Um, uh, generally, when we're talking about the municipal information booklet, um, the actual cost savings are going to be found when we have extended timelines. So we're not paying things like overtime to translators or getting rush orders for printing. Things like that um, are, are sort of what balloon costs sometimes, so we might actually see some shrinkage there, and then just an, a little bit of increase in staff time to actually do the summarization. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that, Audrey. Thank you. All right, well, um, next up we've got Councilmember Keneach. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I was listening to the whole conversation um, as I couldn't get here in time, but I was um, following along. So thank you for your presentation, Councilwoman Black, and for all the conversation that um, preceded. I wanted to kind of pick up, I think, where Councilwoman Sawyer left off, although also with Councilwoman Gilmore's question about the Blue Book. So I guess that my perspective is a little different, which is that democracy is messy, and it's all about checks and balances. And if we had no Blue Book, people would go to the website of each campaign and see things that are questionably 100% accurate and that are advocacy-oriented, and they would make up their mind. I think that having it all in one place is the value of the blue book, right? That, and to me, the check and balance is that both statements are there. <laughs> if one is slightly inflated, if one is slightly off, they, they are there. And voters have in front of them all the tools to go dig deeper. And so I worry less about the blue book needing to be perfect um, because I believe that it has a check and a balance built into it, right? And so, you know, to me, maybe the only issue is the con statement. Should there be a con statement, even if, you know, and I do think you've, you've poked around to find con statements before when none came to you naturally, I think. Like, you know, just, hey, is there anyone, you know? And, and so um, I don't know what percentage of items don't have a con statement, but we should, I, I want us to think about the scope before we over problem solve, right? So what percentage of items get no, I mean, I think our independent monitor referral got no con statement, right? Um, and you know, I think that's a risk in democracy. But I, um, so I think the checks and balances are built into it. I, um, in listening to the conversation, I think that we have m mixed up three different things. So I'm just gonna un unwind them and share my thoughts on each. Summarizing where you have something that exceeds length is easy and they should have the power to do that. That seems like a no-brainer. Where it gets more complicated is where we're now talking about soliciting for additional pros. I, I would not, I, you guys came up with a creative on the fly of keep the proponent statement and then if there are additional pro comments, summarize those in a new section. That would give the pro two sections and the con one, that would not be equitable. So that solution does not work for me in the checks and balances test, right, of having two of them. So then you, if, you, if, you're, if you're with me and you think it's unfair for there to be two sections for the pro and one section for the con, then you are back to the dilemma that you were debating, which is um, do you solicit additional pro statements or accept additional pro statements? And if so, then how, so if you have something written by the author of the legislation, and then you get something from someone who's friendly but likes it for a different reason, they then are in the business of making judgments. And I will say this is where to me it gets really, so, so there's three issues, right? Is the can you summarize for length easy? I think yes. Um, can you start to merge statements and get into judging language and all of that? Or can someone, let me just say that, can someone? And then the third question is who? 
If you're going to do the second thing, who? And I will just say that I get, um, I get real hung up on the who here. And it, it, it's echoes of the titling conversation that we had, honestly, which is that the clerk is not the analogy of the legislative services. Um, I'm a little concerned to hear that you don't think there's a budget impact. This is a policy job. It is not an administrative job. It is not a job related to uh, running elections and making sure procedures. Like the clerk's team has a large set of skills and they are dang good at your jobs. But summarizing statements about legislation involves policy depth. That's why it's done by legislative services at the state. And so to me, I, can, I, I hear Councilwoman Black's desire and other desires that these be more perfect statements. But the only way to get there is to have someone who has policy expertise to do that. And in my humble opinion, that would not be our clerk's office in its current configuration. And I'm not sure it would be the right thing. If you told me you would hire two new FTEs to do this year round, and I don't know what they do in the off season, right? I'm not sure I would think that was the right thing either, but it's a particular skill set. This is where I, exactly where I was on the title writing issue. Being an expert in the solid waste management division ordinance and the, you know, being a, an expert in eviction defense and all of those topics is what's required to, to, to suss out veracity or to suss out, even to put two statements together. Even if you are literally just looking at the statement written by proponents and the statement written by another fan, when you decide in your 500 words which component of the ordinance to highlight and which to ditch because you don't have enough room to do all 10 things that both statements covered, for example, those are policy calls. And so I just think that that's where I get really stuck with the dream of replicating the state. We do not have a legislative services. And, and so I think the question is, if this is the highest priority, of anybody, if it's the highest priority of the council, if it's the highest priority of the clerk, if it's the highest priority of you know the people of Denver, then we should create a neutral, you know, a more robust legislative services type role that is an analogy to the state, and that should be their job. And again, this is a seasonal thing. What do they do in the off season? I don't know, but maybe they could do ballot title work too. Anyway, I just. Um, I, I think it's really difficult to put the expectation of policy expertise on substantive, I mean, the legislative services people work in their areas of the statute year round. They staff committees that work on that area and that topic for multiple years. Mm -hmm. That is not something that can easily be replicated in a division that does election administration. And so that's, you know, so, so that's kind of where I get stuck. So ideal world is we create a truly analogous set of policy experts to do policy work. Not so ideal, but affordable and maybe easier to imagine world is we accept a less than perfect blue book, but it still has checks and balances by both statements, right? But the, the balance is that both are there and both could be imperfect, but the voter always has other tools at their disposal. So, so that's super unsatisfying, but I, you know, that's kind of where I'm struggling with, with the conversation. So just wanted to, to, to share those thoughts. And then I, I might have a couple other comments on the timelines issues, but I will stop there in case there's more discussion on what has been a hot topic. All right. Well, thank you, Councilmember Kanich. And looks like Councilmember Black is going to come up and at least respond or, or yeah. share some of your ideas. Yeah. Thank you, Councilwoman Kanich. I appreciate your feedback. And um, it sounds like you would prefer the status quo except for maybe changing the date, submission dates. Um, With allowing summarization. Okay, yes. Um, what about an idea to allow public comment earlier? So for example, we already have some um, initiatives that we know are gonna be on the ballot. Well, I guess they're already, can people submit comments for those now? No. Once, once they get certified. Okay. So we, we, we know, for example, we might know councils working on something as early as July, or we might know there's um, petitions out on the street and people are getting signatures. What about um, having a public comment period even before it's certified so people would just have a little more time to consider it and possibly submit feedback 
prior to the deadline the, because the state does i know i know it's not the same thing but they do give that feedback long before their 50-day deadline they take it for 100 days in advance i know that they already know what's going to be on it but um just trying to think of a way that we could get more feedback particularly for cons Go ahead, Councilman. I'm not sure if that question was for all of us or me, but I would just say you run into the same problem is who takes the input and what do they do with it? If what you are doing is taking input, it would be inappropriate to take input without someone having the authority to change the substance of the statements. That's the only reason to take input. So you still have to solve for who has the authority to take that input and change the statement based on it. You would have to give, you either give the, you either give the clerk that authority or someone that authority or you don't. And then you have 50 choices. You have the choice about taking multiple statements and merging them. You have the choice about taking public input. But in my opinion, it doesn't change the threshold question, which is who has the authority to use that input and change the statement? Well, today the clerk does for opposition statements. They have the authority to summarize opposition statements. Okay, um, I so more on this. Everybody think about it. Let's talk about it some more. We, we, I think we all agree we need to improve the blue books for the benefit of the voters. Times. We've got two more times that we're gonna meet in budget and policy. Yeah. And so um, this does give us a little bit more time um, for folks to think about this. I did have um, one uh, clarifying point, and then I know we've got um, a couple more council members uh, in the queue. What you laid out, Councilwoman Kanich, um, I, I get what you're saying about, you know, summarize for length, that's fine. Um, the pro statement, um, the author of the bill would have that, um, but the con um, side of it, um, I, I guess it circles all the way back to um, if the clerk does um, have that ability, just the, the, the shoring up or exactly what that division is within the clerk and recorder's office to make sure that there's independence in that work is what I'm hearing you say. Um, thank you. Thank you for the question, Council President. It's less about um, independence and more about policy knowledge and expertise. So as I just want to clarify what I heard from Alton. If they get multiple opposition statements, they are not evaluating them. They are simply trying to cover as many of the points from them in one statement as possible. So they aren't trying to determine this one has something that's factually inaccurate and we're not using that. That's not what they're doing today. What we're talking about is something fundamentally different than mm -hmm. summarizing. We are talking about evaluating. And to me, that requires a level of policy expertise that exceeds the skill set that the clerk's office typically hires for you. And again, I cannot say enough about how amazing this team is. They run amazing elections. It is different than knowing the housing statute. It's different than knowing the zoning code, which is what the people who do that job in other places, that's what they do for a living, is they do that section of code and they know it inside and out. So, so and, and Alton, if I misstated what you described, but I just, I don't think that what they're doing today is figuring out whether the opposition is good or bad. I think they are simply saying, we have five statements, how much of it can we put together in 500 words? Okay. Um, Alton is nodding his head and that is what he conveyed. And, and I'm not proposing to change that. I'm just proposing that we should get more input and that they, can summarize that input. I'm not asking them to, to verify it um, because I've right. gotten. And, and then I understand okay. that then that becomes um, the biggest part of the conversation potentially because who has that expertise to do that work then is the open question that's out there. And it sounds like the clerk, um, the clerk's office staff feel that they do, but that there is a much more robust and, and or, or maybe they don't. I think that's probably an evaluation that the clerk's um, office might wanna go back and, and make. Um, and so I, I wanna get um, the last two um, members here in the queue before um, we end in about 11 minutes. And so Councilmember Sawyer, um, we might have circled all the way back. I know. 
no, it. Go ahead. Legit, you did. Yeah. Um, no, appreciate that. And I will be super quick, and we can discuss this, uh, you know, at a future time. But it occurs to me, based on Councilman Kenich's um, uh, stated concerns, that we're essentially having the same conversation we had around ballot title setting. Um, the solution that we came up with when it came to ballot title setting was um, that statements would, or t titles would come from council, um, clerk would finalize, and, pr and proponents, um, clerk would, would finalize them, send them back to council and the city attorney's office for approval, and then uh, that would be that. What if we were to essentially implement the same policy for uh, for statement for statements, so that um, it's not simply uh, you know staff of the clerk's office would you know whoever would would we could open up public comment more um, you know all the public comments could come in proponents could write theirs um, you know clerk's office could summarize additional pros, um, all the cons, et cetera, and then uh, it gets goes to our city attorney and to the city, you know, legislative services for us and city attorney's office for review and suggested edits and or approval, and then goes forward. Is that, does that seem like something that would, Councilwoman Kanish does not look happy. <laughs> I, I no poker face over there. <laughs> In the interest of time, this might um, be the first topic that we pick up at the next budget and policy um, meeting. I, it, it won't be next week. It'll be the 20th um, because we won't have a quorum. But um, Councilwoman Kanich? Yeah, I mean, my face was, I think, just because I want to remind everyone that our, our, our discussion about ballot title was all about the attorneys making those decisions, not the bodies or the branches. So that was an important distinction. This is the problem with using that word council. <laughs> Which one? With a C or with an S? Um, and my, just, my concern is that uh, the timelines are already tight, and this is a much more substantive job, and it happens much later in the process than the title. So I think it would be logistically... Even if you did settle on the fact that it's the attorneys, I would be concerned that we probably couldn't manage the volume, size, and length at that late stage in the process. The titles are much shorter and they come at the beginning when you aren't under all those deadlines to certify all those things on that scary list that they have to do. So I, it's not that the idea is not a creative one, but that's, I was just imagining uh, our team doing like, you know, a review of how many items are already certified for the ballot this fall, like six, I don't know. Anyways, we'll, we'll pro well, we have a number of citizen initiatives. We've got referrals coming. Let's just call it a dozen. Let's say that there's a dozen measures and they literally have hours or a di couple days to turn around. You know what I mean? That just, that's the, it's a lot more work in a much shorter time period than the way the titles roll in, because the titles roll in in a pretty staggered way. So yeah. totally, uh, apologies for, I was just imagining the workload. No, no, I, I totally understand that. I just, one of the other things we're talking about is moving back that timeline. So that would sort of soften that challenge, I think, a little bit. But um, it, I, I know Councilman Hines wants to make a comment, so I'm, I'm done. All right. Well, thank you, Councilwoman Sawyer, and um, keep coming up with those creative solutions. I, I think we're all, um, you know, interested in making sure that we have good information um, to the voters and that they can trust what we're sending out um, to them. And so, appreciate the the conversation, Councilmember Hines. Uh, thank you, Council President, and um, and thank you uh, for all the council members for the continued discussion. I I agree with Councilmember Kanich about. If we get more input, but don't allow the, um, the the clerk's office or a subject matter expert to synthesize that information, that's just more for you to try to copy or cut and paste into 500 words. And uh, and if we get valid input from that stakeholder process, it might get to be very unwieldy for the clerk's office to come up with um, all of these great ideas that we get from the community into 500 words. Uh, so I, I think there is still the discussion of who, like synthesizing as opposed to uh, copy pasting and boiling down. And the other comment that I would make just as an extension, um, this could, I, I'm, I also just want to be aware 
uh, or want people to be aware that this could also be a route for free legal subject matter expertise. So, you know, if a ballot issue, let's say I think Denver deserves sidewalks and, um, and I'm just gonna throw a ballot, something on, um, uh, onto the ballot, or at least I'm gonna uh, move in that direction, um, I already get a legality review from, uh, from our office, from the you know, city council staff, but then the clerk would also potentially provide a subject matter expert, right? And, and if that's the case, um, then, then we would get not only the, the review of the legality of the, the um, citizen initi initiative, but also um, we would give free counsel to the, uh, f free attorney review from subject matter experts just to determine if that's a, a counsel with C or S. Um, and uh, so I wonder if we would have more stuff thrown against the citizen initiated ballot wall uh, for that free uh, subject matter expertise analysis. And just, just, just make, uh, that's just something that I'm thinking about and maybe that's what we want. Maybe we want a better educated um, population uh, or maybe we'll have so much come at us in a very compressed period of time that, um, that we would just be unable to fulfill it. I'm just putting it out there. Thank you, Council President. All right, thank you, Councilmember Hines. Um, and I do have one question. Um, I don't think it should take a lot of time, but I'm not quite sure, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, pose it uh, here because on slide 14, um, where the clerk and recorder's recommendation is um, around the petition deadlines, require the signatures be deemed sufficient by the 120 day deadline. Um, the concern that council member Black brought up um, that the petitioners need clarity. And so what date would the petitions need to be submitted in order to be verified by the 100 20 day mark and so I know right now it looks like you all have 25 days to verify signatures but have you given some thought and it looks like Audrey thank you ma'am um, the current the requirement is that we have up to 30 25 days excuse me uh, to verify signatures but there is sort of a little pressure release valve on that if there's um, uh, an addendum to those um, for another 25 days so you know, already ballot committees are, are kind of doing this dance to sort of know. So if they really do have all of the signatures that they need and they're in a sort of clean format, um, those could get done feasibly in far less than 25 days, but a grand total of 50 is the, um, is the total longest time possible for that. We don't have that happen often, but we want to sort of be upfront about it. Okay, great, thank, thank you. you. And so if you, technically then have the 50 days or, or you would have the 50 days, I guess, um, and you don't have to throw a date out today, but maybe on the 20th when you all come back, it would just be helpful that for clarity wise, yeah. we're able to share with folks um, what that potentially mm -hmm. might look like. Yeah, so it'd be 170. So we would just kind of have to go do the math because that would be different for each um, sort of November or yeah. okay. uh, April election. Um, and so to be clear, um, that April election that does bleed all the way into the sort of prior November election. So we, we are like, we're really sort of mixing and matching some things there. Um, but I will do a deep dive on that to make sure that we're not also hitting some other areas. Um, there's also blackout dates where we do not, we're not required to do signature verification while VSPCs are open. So that's just, that's a pure staff management piece. Um, but I can, I can do the math and I'll bring that to you on the 20th. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Audrey. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and turn it back over to Councilwoman Black. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for the conversation about, about the ballot booklet. It is really important that we have a good ballot booklet. And um, I don't think that we should get rid of it. I don't think that would look good if we tried to get rid of it. So I think we need to do whatever it takes to make sure that it has useful information for voters. And so I don't think we should talk about how hard it is because I think we need to figure out what the solution is. Um, so I challenge everyone to think of some solutions. You guys, you guys, attorneys, everyone, um, let's put our heads together and think of some additional recommendations um, to make it even better. 
Um, I had mentioned a few times in previous conversations that we had like a dedicated team um, that would work on all these issues during the parts of the year that we are dealing with them. And they would be part of the review and comment, but they would take it all the way through the ballot booklet. Um, I know I've talked, I talked, I mentioned it to you guys, I mentioned it to the BAM, I've talked to Sky Stewart about it and Brendan Hanlon. I don't know how it would work, but you know, it seems like the people who are doing the review and comment are there on day one and they could follow the process and already, you know, sort of be experts on whatever those, those bills are. Um, I don't know what that would look like, but it's just one idea we had. Um, so everybody, please think about that. And then um, I'm also proposing some um, council processes for our own referrals. And I do honestly believe that we should have an earlier deadline to refer ballot measures. It's so condensed at the end of August. It puts them in a bind. Um, it limits public discussion. So it's also a timeline issue. So at the next meeting, we will also talk about that because it does also impact that booklet. So I guess, um, thank you everyone. And then three more follow-ups for the clerk's office that I heard from you guys. Um, we want more details on the, your proposal for the write-ins and what your solution is. If you could just give us a summary of the details. So if there, if there is some late, okay. And the second one, um, Audrey, you talked about more, um, you'll take another look at the timeline and we can have any uniformity of dates. And that would include this 120 days. I, I'm not, I don't really quite get it yet. So if you can explain that, I, what you just said to Councilwoman Gilmore. Um, and more detail on the candidate deadlines. Um, Councilwoman Sawyer brought up some issues with the holidays. So now I know we were just talking about 75 days, but if you could give us actual dates, I think that would be helpful for people to consider and then the last thing was just more on the pro con stuff. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for the great discussion as usual. Thank you, Councilwoman Black. Right. And just a reminder to folks, um, we won't have budget and policy next Monday, but join us um, on the 20th uh, to continue the conversation. And thank you, um, Councilwoman Black, for your work and uh, the clerk and recorder for being here, Clerk Lopez and your team. So thank you, everybody. We're adjourned.